Hey, everybody. Wow, look at all these faces. Oh my goodness, Beverly. Good morning, Beverly. Good morning, Ariel. Good morning, Hetty. Corinda. Jael, Alex. Good morning, Angela. Good morning, Angela. Mama Mona. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning, Alice. Good morning, Monique. I uh, wish I had a bigger screen. <laughs> I could see everybody. Adonze, good morning. Samantha, um, wow. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Morning Coffee with the Foundation for Black Women's Wellness. We are so grateful for you tuning in this morning. We're grateful uh, that you keep coming back every week to spend this hour of wellness with us. And we thank you also for your patience this morning as our very hardworking guest today, who I'll introduce in a minute who really need no introduction um, as they joined us this morning amidst all of the work that they are doing in our community. So we thank you for hanging out with us in the wait room for a while, but we are gonna get moving. Uh, we are waiting for our guest Brandy Grayson to join us, but we are already joined by M. Adams who is on the call with us this morning and we are so grateful. Um, keep on coming in, keep on coming in. Does it look like we have everybody out of the weight room, uh, Janine? Do we have everyone here? Yes. All right, good morning again, everyone, and welcome to Morning Coffee again. My name is Lisa Payton Care, CEO, founder, and president of the Foundation for Black Women's Wellness, and I'm here with our team members. Wave your hand, team members. Uh, which includes Aaliyah Stevenson, our Chief Programs Officer, who is our co-host today. Um, whenever we host, we like to remind women of our very simple mission as the Foundation for Black Women's Wellness, and that is to empower a generation of well Black women and to build uh, a community, a nation, and a world where Black women and our families thrive. And so this call is a part of that work that we do to connect uh, to create spaces for Black women to come together, to heal, to grow, to cultivate, um, to develop our action plans together, which is so relevant to the call today, um, and to provide practical tools as we all uh, rise up in our journey to becoming the most well, healthy, and free Black women that we could possibly be. Uh, our topic today is Black women healing as we fight. And that topic is so very critical to us as we see the challenges that we continue to confront in our world that have come to a head uh, this year, this month, this week. Um, and it was important to us to have guests today who are in the trenches on that work alongside all of us who are doing our work in respective ways as Black women to free ourselves, to strengthen our community, uh, to secure the future for ourselves and our children and we particularly honor these two women who are here today. Hello, Brandy. Good morning. How are you? Are you you're muted right now? We can't hear you. That's all right. That's all right. It keeps muting me automatically. Okay, there I am. <laughs> and for those who are on the call, please stay muted for the duration of the call but please begin to share your questions in the chat box. Mandy, it just muted you again, girl. <laughs> uh, please share your questions and also just your comments, your salutations, your words of love. Because uh, as we thought about this topic as a team last week, Black Women Healing As We Fight, uh, we thought about who we wanted our guests to be. Um, and M and Brandy, your names came immediately to mind as we thought about women who are emulating and setting the powerful example for our community of what it means to heal as we fight um, and that we don't have time to not do either of those. It's essential in our work and in our life that we acknowledge um, that this life is a fight for us, but healing is equally as important in how we strike that balance. So we're here today to talk to both of you, not only about your work, but about you, um, about what you're leading, um, about what you're seeing, and, and about how you are, and what lessons you can teach us, and what lessons you can share to us as we all determine and continuously determine our next steps and our place 
um, in this movement that is, that is already underway. So with that being said, I want to have both of you in the sake of time introduce yourselves. As you all know, M. Adams uh, is the co-executive director of Freedom Inc. Um, and I pulled your bio, M, offline. Um, and it was so powerful when I read it. Um, and as we've all watched your work over the many years, um, and I'd love for you to introduce yourself and tell us more about Freedom Inc. And Brandy Grayson, who is the CEO, founder, and president of Urban Triage. Um, you're also both uh, mothers, um, spouses, significant others, um, folks who have your own unique history. So I'm gonna give you the chance and the opportunity to introduce yourselves. Tell us about you, your work, um, and let's start with Em. Hey, everybody. I am so happy to be here. Thank you very much uh, to Lisa Kerr, to the team for Foundation for Black Women Wellness. I don't get a chance to say this enough, but I'm actually a huge fan of the work and the intervention that you all are making on behalf of Black women. I think it's so important. We need everybody to be fighting for the wellness of Black women. And I, I'm just, yeah, again, I'm very appreciative of y'all's work and thankful to be on the call. So uh, my name is M. Adams. I'm originally from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I've moved to Madison in 2003, where I attended the university. And like many others, I've been here since. Um, I am co-executive director of Freedom, Inc. And our mission is around ending violence within and against Black and Southeast Asian communities. And when we say violence within, we're speaking um, very much about the harm that happens from people that we love. So a lot of our work at Freedom Inc. is around ending domestic violence, sexual assault, elder abuse, child abuse, incest, um, et cetera. And when we say against our communities, we're thinking about structural violence. So that's about capitalism and poverty. It's about police violence against us. It's about unjust education systems. It's about a lack of access to food or housing and other things that we know that our communities experience. And um, just to, in a, um, to addition to draw on a bit of what uh, Lisa raised. So I am a parent and I am proud to be a parent um, of adopted children. I think as black folks, we are always making family in a lot of ways that perhaps the state doesn't understand. So I'm very proud to be um, a parent of adopted children. And as a parent, um, I identify as Baba, um, and not Mama, but as Baba. So I just wanted to offer that, and then I'll let Brandy introduce herself. Good morning. Sorry I'm late. Um, I'm just going to keep it real. I got in the shower, and I forgot <laughs> how long I was in there. <laughs> Guess I needed that. So um, yeah, so my name is Brady Grayson. I grew up here in Madison, Wisconsin. I moved here when I was around um, 10, um, became an activist in high school, um, grew into organizing and mobilizing in college at UW-Madison, worked as an assistant social worker, um, out of college at JFF, um, did a lot of referrals, did a lot of home visits, intakes, things like that. Um, and then I left um, that job and went into insurance. I, I, my, my resume is weird and I do not have an updated bio, right? So that's something that I probably should uh, work on some yes. soon. <laughs> Yes, I'm going to scold you about that bio on the urban. No, you did. Like, you did. not sufficient. <laughs> you did. <laughs> I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Um, so long story short, I've had many hats from a social worker to real estate um, to claims um, adjuster um, um, and currently working for different nonprofits as um, a business manager, as director of uh, job programming. And currently I am the CEO and founder of Urban Triage, Inc., um, we're an organization for the people, by the people. Our mission um, for Urban Triage is to support Black families in becoming self-sufficient as individuals, as families, and within their communities. We provide um, personal leadership, personal change, um, and advocacy training. It's a 90-day training. Um, the name of our training is called Supporting Healthy Black Families. The objective, really, of our training is to decolonize our minds, to help us understand the death and breadth of white supremacy, racism, how to navigate it, and how to create outside of its 
constructs. Um, so that's one of our, like our foundation to the work that we do. We also provide community support services um, from advocacy to um, in housing to IEP, um, to uh, um, rental assistance, miscellaneous funds. Um, what else do we do? We, are we, all, we currently have a um, partnership with MMSD to provide online workshops. We um, are in partnership with some organizations under our Dane County Collaboration of Black Service Providers. Brand new thing. Um, and I think um, you guys should watch out because there's more to come with that collaboration. That's all I will say. Um, so yeah, most of our work, all of our work is focused on centering Black people, Black thought, and really creating um, space for all Blackness, um, not politically respect, you know, we don't do political, you know, respectability. We really pride ourselves in existing outside of the constructs and attributes of white supremacy, patriarchal capitalism. And so now we're in the streets with our people because that's where our people asked us to be. I mean, as you probably know, uh, M. Adams and I were co-founders of Young, Gifted, and Black, which organized mm -hmm. and starting in 2014, I believe, um, when Mike Brown was murdered. Um, so me and M relationship actually started there. So it's it's kind of like deja vu um, that we're back in this situation um, where we're out in the streets. And just to be clear, I had already, I said since um, Young, Gifted and Black um, kind of like dispersed and we kind of went to do our own things that I wouldn't be back in the streets. But you got to be careful what you say because sometimes your mission ain't your mission, right? Sometimes it's God's mission. So thank you, Lisa, for inviting us here today. Um, yeah, and I'm just excited to be here. So thank you. Well, I want to say first that we're grateful that you all are here. Please do not um, take for granted that we, we know how, how your days are arranged. We know you wake up at the crack of dawn. We know you're up, Brandy. I've witnessed you texting at three o'clock in the morning. Uh, we are very proud and I want to call you out for being what you speak to be and always working to collaborate and pull our community together. When you reached out to me to say, can a foundation partner on the Dane County Collaborative of Black Service Providers that reach out means everything to us and what has been created from that is quite powerful. Um, all of the tools that have been developed to connect our organizations together and all the relief efforts and all the people and the extension of the reach and the power of our community has come to bear because of that idea and because of that reach. And I know that there is much more to come. So I just wanna honor you and M for saying yes today, because I know you have places to be. <laughs> and I know you have um, things that you're working on even before this call and after this call. And we just want to sit in that space for a minute to say, we honor you all and we cherish you. Um, some of us are, are not out there with you on a day to day in the marches because we're out here running organizations and doing other things. But we're always with you. Um, and we're just a call away. You just tell us what you need. Um, and we will be there in the ways that we can. So we thank you for that. Um, my team will probably scold me because I skipped uh, the important thing. Um, instead of doing our small business highlight today, we want to encourage everyone to give immediately to the 350 bail fund. Um, the link to the fund, I believe, is in the chat. And as both of these women are leading community-based organizations like ours, we rely on community support to continue what we do. We also ask you to go to their websites and to give. So the Freedom Inc. website and the Urban Triage links are in the chat. When you give to one, you support all of us. So do that um, and continue to do that and continuously do that. Um, so we have a question for you all in the chat as well as we continue to speak. We want to ask you ladies who are tuned in, how are you doing? On a scale of one to 10 this morning, we're checking in with you and you tell us how you are doing. And we already see some questions coming in. Oh my goodness, before we ask our first question. Um, so keep them coming. To get started on the questions, um, we know what we're contending with right now. We know we're dealing with the triple, I call it the triple pandemic of racism, you know, pre existing <laughs> condition for America. Uh, the pandemic of COVID-19 and the pandemic of police brutality, which is woven uh, through that context of racism that we've all lived with since before the day we were born. Um, what that means to us personally, what that means to us collectively, 
and how we're faring in a time where we have forces from every side working to really destroy our lives and our communities. Um, how are you taking care of yourself as leaders, as you're crafting movements, as you're organizing people, as you're being frontline messengers? Um, how are you approaching that work, understanding what it means to your very physical body and your own emotional and psychological resources as you lead this work in the constant traumas? Well, for me, um, I, 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 do, I fast intermittently um, and I also work out and I also take tons of vitamins and herbs. So if you see me over here eating and sipping, this is my Edelberry syrup. This is my cod liver oil. <laughs> like just protecting my, my body and encouraging my, my immune system to do what it needs to do. Um, so I got like a bag of vitamins. So if you see me leaning over, I'm, I'm, I'm leaning for my vitamins, okay? Um, so really um, just being conscious of it, but it is really challenging, right? Because sometimes our days start at four and sometimes I don't go to bed until one. Um, so just being conscious of that, like, and giving myself a minute, like today in the shower, my body was just like, stay here. And I did, you know what I mean? And I didn't mean to stay that long. And I jumped down, I'm like, oh, <laughs> it's past nine o'clock. <laughs> but sometimes it's just making space for you. And your body and your spirit knows what it needs when it needs it. So just listen, be in tune. Um, and a lot of times, like yesterday, I didn't show up for our protest yesterday because I knew um, that I needed to just rest and I needed to spend time with my son, you know, um, because in the work is, is also challenging to balance my relationship with my kids. I have lots of children, right? Like I have a four year old, I have a 20 year old, I have a 17 year old who has a two year old, I have two 26 year, 26 year olds, and I had a, a 14 and 17 year old in my home as well, but um, they had to leave because they wouldn't quarantine, right? Um, I'm a treatment foster mom. Um, so I'm, I'm constantly balancing my wellness, my work, and my family, and sometimes I fail, and sometimes I fail in all three. And I don't mean like I, I like I just mean what I say. I fail, and I have to be able to acknowledge that with my children and my family, um, and be diligent and intentional on not getting so focused on my work that I absolutely exclude them. And it is a hard balance. And I, I have a challenge with anxiety and other things that you know I deal with. So recognizing when those things are coming up for me and taking a step back and doing some meditation, some breathing and getting my butt up and exercising because exercising like helps me relieve, relieve, release a lot of the, the energy that's balled up inside of me and my shoulders. And as soon as we get back open, I'm gonna start back going to the chiropractor. I know they're open, but I'm still like, mm. um, but so I'm gonna go start going back to the chiropractor and start going back to yoga, cause I love yoga. So yeah, just being intentional on making space for, my, for ourselves. Wow, uh, you just, you're, you're muted again, Brandy, but I see your mouth moving. <laughs> that's because I was yelling at my kids. I muted it on purpose. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Uh, that's so funny to me when we talk about women leading movements and we got to mute to yell at our kids because we're mothering. You know, I saw your baby, you know, sticking out of the roof of the car the other day um, at the protest. And all I could think about is, okay, she had to get up this morning. She had to feed the baby. She had to bathe the baby. She had to get the baby mentally ready to come outside. She had to pack up the bag to be in the car with the baby. And she's out there on the bullhorn. <laughs> representing um and that's so important to us as women that people see us in the fullness of our black womanhood yeah uh, and that yeah. even in our mothering we are activists even in your fostering and mothering more children when i saw how many how many children you have and i understood um you know and, and understanding your story even better and reading more about it, Brandy, honestly, because we've had moments to be in each other's space and to talk a little bit, but we've not had the chance to go deep into each other's stories. But I glean, right? I glean um, and I can see the activism in your mothering, right? Um, and just to put that out there for community, for funders, for allies, for supporters, for our own people, our own community who don't always understand the layers of sacrifice and the layers of commitment, how deep and dense our commitment is as Black women in these movements, because we got whole lives that we're managing outside of what people see 
uh, publicly yeah. you know, papers or on the news clips. So I want to want to call you out for um, one of the best things that I heard in your response when I asked you on Sunday if you could do this. You said, well, I usually work out at nine o'clock. That's my gym time. <laughs> but I can switch it to 630 and be on the call and to know that you're prioritizing that. That's a lesson for everybody on this call that even a um, in your face uh, leader of movements has her gym time to protect her wellness and her well-being. Uh, M, how are you taking care of yourself amidst your leadership and your family and your needs? Mm -hmm. There are a few things. One of the, the biggest things is that um, I have a small altar by my bedside um, that keeps me connected to the ancestors. I always have a candle that I burn, and every time I start a new candle, I blow or pray intentions into it. Um, I call on, I think I have um, like a little stone or a, a little artifact, I guess we can call it. That mm -hmm. was my mother's, which is it's part of that altar. I also have um, Jamaica Kincaid's autobiography of my mother book there, or other texts that bring me um, encouragement or centeredness I have there also and then I always have um, a little piece of fruit as an offering for the ancestors and maybe also some water um, in the spirit of libation so that's important for me I think I feel really connected to um, my ancestors the ones that I do not know whose names I do not know as well as the people who I've loved very much that I have lost like my mother, like my grandmother, um, and other people. And so I think that's so much of what keeps both of my feet on the ground amidst the chaos. I think a lot is poured into me uh, in ways I am still learning. Um, but I think so much of that is ancestral. And so I make sure I give reverence and stay connected and honor there. In terms of my body, so there are a couple things about me. I'm both gluten-free and dairy-free and have been for years. Um, which means that I'm very mindful of what I put in my body. Um, and so as a result of that, I don't have a lot of junk, you know? So everybody, uh, I'm not, I know people are pizza, pizza lovers, so I'm not trying to diss pizza. But uh, like, for example, at the rally, everybody is eating pizza, slices of pizza, and I'm eating like a nut, seed, and berry trail mix that I prepared. Mm -hmm. And so when you all see me um, in action, and I got that pouch, it's like a snack in there. Um, because I know that I can't eat a lot of things. And instead of um, jeopardizing my health, I bring something small, even if it's not a lot, to keep me nourished. I drink a lot of water. So I drink at least a gallon of water a day. Here's my water jug for the day. A gallon, Lord have I know, <laughs> I drink a lot of water. Um, and I, yeah, I drink a lot of water every day. I also um, walk. I walk about uh, a marathon a week, so 26, 27 miles a week. Um, so different m amounts each day. When we have a long protest day, I get in six, seven miles, but um, other days just a, two or three miles and I get to listen to either some of my favorite songs, some of my mother's music, or I get to listen to Toni Morrison's voice, a book on tape. But that's just, that's something that makes me feel good. And then uh, lastly, I'll point to, I make sure I keep a hobby. Um, so I'm learning to play the trumpet. I am not good at it. I mean, I think I'm good. Well, I'm not, you know, I'm working on it. But it's, um, it's something that I do. It's, I make sure I practice 15, 20, at least 20 minutes a day. And it's small. I do it even when I'm not tired. But it's something that I like that makes me feel good, that activates another part of me um, that's not about giving to somebody else or about uh, doing something for somebody else. And so those are some of the things that I do um, for my wellness. That's so powerful to hear that you take the time. Um, you know, I think we see you in the largesse of your persona and in your work and in uh, the power of how you speak and how it moves people. And then I had to balance that with the vision of you preparing a trail mix and putting it in a pouch. <laughs> and, and I love that juxtaposition of of both of those parts um, and to know that that loving self-care of taking the time to be conscious and mindful of how you're gonna go out into the march prepared 
to meet your needs while you're defending our community is quite powerful. So ladies take lessons from that. Uh, Aaliyah, what are we hearing in the chat? What are we hearing in the chat? There's so much love going on right now. <laughs> it's, it's overwhelming. Um, and Brandy, you guys are being surrounded in love. Um, folks are, are with you. They want to know what, what they can do to be more connected to the work. Um, people are uh, honoring. They're like, yes to the ancestors. Yes to you know, devotional time, yes to um, meditation and prayer, yes to um, centering ourselves. So I think a lot of what you're saying is just really resonating. Um, so, so yeah, there's just a lot of, a lot of love, which is what we need right now. So. Mm -hmm. And how did folks yes, help? Oh, I'm sorry. No, and no. then people are feeling good and you guys are raising their energy. If they came in as a five, they're at a seven now. Um, but we're really, I mean, we're resilient people and we see that in these numbers. I mean, we're in the fives and, and up to eight. So we're in that range right now. And I think that's a, a reflection of our energizing and our, and our ability to come together in, in spaces like this. So we're looking good. Yes. And, and one thing that you said, um, um, and I know you, you've referenced this many times, Brandy, in your remarks, the consciousness as Black women that we walk with our ancestors. Yes. Um, I've often remarked to people that um, in my own work, I literally, um, and this is literally and figuratively feel my grandmother on my left shoulder and my mother at my right shoulder, and they literally are my strength that propel me ahead um, in life and in work. Um, and I speak to them, I talk to them, I talk to them daily um, and to others, you know, past and present um, and just recognizing and acknowledging um, that spiritual practice and foundation of who we are as black women and the role that our very real and alive ancestors play um, and pushing us forward even today and that they're with us. Um, and as we speak about ancestors, um, I just want to call a few names and the names are too numerous and to call them particularly as you all elevate their names to the world. George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, Tony Robinson, Sandra Bland, Tamir Rice, Trayvon Martin, Mike Brown, and so many more, you know. Um, and it's my belief that they are with us and watching. Um, they are with us and watching. Uh, you've told us a little bit about your work, but we'd like to understand more about the roots of that work because we know so often our work uh, emerges from personal experiences uh, that we have. Uh, you all know that uh, the work of the Foundation for Black Women's Wellness came forth because my mother and so many Black women in my life died um, prematurely uh, from what I call the stress of being black women um, and the heavy burdens that we carry from birth to the time we leave. Um, and that having been unacceptable to me, um, you know, I sat one day and once I had written the names of about 60 black women who were younger than 60 who had died, um, that is what propelled me into action. So wanting to understand better. And Emma, I pulled some things from your bio um, and, I, and I asked you before the call if you minded if I went a little bit personal with you all. And I'm gonna go there with you too, Brandy, so get ready. But you don't put it all out there anyway, so. <laughs> Which I love, the transparency, right? So in your bio, Em, you told us that you were born and raised in Milwaukee. Um, your dad has been incarcerated most of your life. Um, and that you come from a community that has been the target of extreme police violence. Um, and in 2016, your mother transitioned after fighting cancer and many, many forms of violence. As a queer Black woman, you've developed and advocated for a strong intersectional approach in many venues, um, and that this has shaped your work. Can you talk to us a bit about how those experiences uh, shaped the activism and the work that you lead today? Yeah, so much of my work is um, based on my lived experience. So um, a lot of people don't know this, but uh, you know, a lot of the work that I do at Freedom Inc. Um, is about figuring out how to end gender-based violence, in particular focusing on violence inside of people's relationships by intimate partners. Mm -hmm. um, and family members. And so much of what inspires that is my mother. 
So um, my mother, or well, my story is that my father was a very, very abusive man um, in terms of his treatment of women, very, very abusive man. And he, um, I mean, he was even a pimp, right? So he, um, so you can imagine the things associated with that. Mm -hmm. And uh, my mother was part of the, part of the women that he has encountered and has been um, abusive toward. And so growing up inside of that dynamic where uh, my mother was, you know, and I came to understand this more as I was older, but so much of how she was in the world and toward us was how she was surviving him. Mm -hmm. So she um, developed a drinking addiction. And when I was younger, I didn't fully understand that. But as I got older, I did. So she developed a drinking addiction. I think she never talked about it like this, but she suffered from um, depression. She really struggled with being able to form um, per perhaps deeper forms of intimacy with her children and um, some of the other things that happens to people who are survivors of intimate partner violence. And so that shaped so much of what I thought should be so for my mother, but also for me, for queer people, for transgender people. And so I really enter the work from the space of, um, you know, fighting for a world where we are free of violence inside of our relationships, where if we are free of violence inside of our homes, and then we are free of violence inside of our communities. And so that is actually sort of the compass um, that really motive, that really steers me across a number of issues. So people may see my work and say, oh, well, you're fighting against the police. You're, you are fighting housing or here you are fighting them about a community garden. It's because really what I'm rooted in and why I'm so appreciative of black women's wellness is I'm really rooted in this concept of wellness for me, this concept of wellness for what the world would have been like for my mother, right? Like yeah. some, the world killed her, like she didn't just die. And I think we should find more radical ways about speaking about the loss or really the theft of black life, especially of black women, like she was taken at the age of 54. Um, and that cancer, you know, that came into her body from a number of things, mm -hmm. from environmental violence, from poverty, from some of the violence I, I just think that she experienced by my father, but also other partners, other men. And so that really shapes how I interact with the world. So when we approach, when I approach these issues like policing, I'm coming from it, like, what do I deserve to have in order to feel safe? Yeah. What do I deserve to have in order to be well? And does this thing add to my wellness? Does this thing build us up? Does this thing provide transformative opportunities? Because I even think there should have been a transformative opportunity for my father to become a different person, right? And, I, and those are the things that I uh, measure and evaluate. Um, and so, so much, of, I'll, I'll sort of cut it short there, but that's, so, so much of my life is driven by those realities. Ooh, yeah. Um, you are, I just want you to know, you are lifting people as you speak and you are hitting so many pieces in our heart. Um, what you said, the theft of black life. Um, I'm not going to expound on that, but that kind of summarized my whole experience as well. And, and we're going to talk about the use of that term. I'm going to use it, but I'm going to credit you uh, because so much of what we speak about in terms of health disparities, um, social inequality and all those pieces is really far more personal to us as we see our loved ones in our communities ravaged um, and our lives stolen out of conditions that we endure that are preset before we even come forward. So I thank you for giving us that language. And we're going to come back to that in a minute. Uh, Brandy, you, um, and we're related. We're related through marriage. You're really my cousin, right? You know this. <laughs> We've talked about this. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, we are. Um, but I'm still learning about you. And I was looking at much of what you shared um, uh, in, your, in your bio in one of the articles that you shared. I've been in Madison since the age of 10. I came here with my biological mom, who at the time was addicted to drugs. I had my first baby at the age of 13 and was placed in foster care until age 17. Uh, graduated from high school, attended UW, all while being a mom 
Um, and in another place I talked, I read about just the extensive experience in foster care and all the things it exposed you to and, and all the things you endured um, as an unprotected child uh, who is now emerged as a woman who is protecting so many. Can you tell us about that journey and how it has informed your work? Ooh, Lord. Okay. <laughs> 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 and we don't have to have a part two to this call because right, right, right. <laughs> 15 minutes I don't know how that happened but yeah. <laughs> so yeah like my 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 experience my past all shape what I do um and that is really where my passion um and the fire comes from um I often tell people that um, you know, my middle name is Pearl for people who don't know. And that really represents me. Like, you know what I mean? Like, um, and because in my world, from an early age, I was exposed to, since birth, I was exposed to crack. I was inside my mom's womb exposed to crack. I came out of my mom um, and was exposed to the consequences of having a parent on crack, which means that I spent my childhood, like you mentioned, unprotected, uh, bouncing from home to home, from my uncle to my grandmothers, to my aunts, to back to foster home. Um, in each one, in each one of those homes, I was abused. If I wasn't, it was it was sexual, physical, mental, emotional abuse. And when my my grandmother, like my grandmother, would abuse us, right, and then put us back in the foster home, and then bring us back home, and then put us into um, uh, the, this hospital for uh, mental illness. Um, in Chicago, it's called the Hard Grove Hospital. Um, and I remember being nine and being placed there with my brother, um, who's passed away, God rest his soul. He was my heart and soul. Um, I remember being placed in that hospital with him and I loved the hospital. I loved it because it was structured. Um, I knew when I was gonna eat. I knew when, um, if I needed something, all I had to do is ask. I knew when group was. You know what I mean? I knew where my social time, where my friends were, and I loved it. And my brother um, had a to totally opposite experience in that hospital. And back then, um, I don't know what it, it is like currently, but in that moment, um, it had to be about 30 years ago, because I'm 40, um, my brother hated it. So he would like go off. And so they kept my brother strapped to a table all day from morning to night. And not only did they keep him strapped to a table, we got to see my brother strapped to that table. Um, um, he was just in the hallway and we would walk past and you know, transitioning to different areas and he'll be screaming and hollering. Um, and he was about 11. So that really was traumatizing for him and me. And my brother never got over that. He never got over that pain of abandonment and what he dealt with in the hospital. Um, and it led to alcoholism, you know, um, and, and on top of all the other abuse that he suffered and my, and my brother died as a, at an early age from alcoholism. Um, yeah, so that's just a piece of my life, but that's just, it, it's very symbolic of what my life was as a little girl. Like no, no one cared, you know what I mean? And I was put in unsafe places to be um, sexually abused, to be assaulted. I didn't know what sex was, you know? I just knew that I was in places where grown men and boys that were 10 years older than I was, was constantly touching me, right? And putting their hands on me and fondling me. Um, and I didn't know what to do. I didn't know where to go. I didn't, it, it was just what it was. I, what would I do? Um, I lived in a neighborhood where older men would yell out or try to solicit sex for young girls. And I mean like 10 or 11, like I was super young, y'all. This wasn't teenage, this was, this was, this was super young. Um, and I remember this one guy across the street um, where we lived off of 77 in Halstead. He um, gave me $20 one day because you know how kids are. We used to have candy stores. You can go get pickles, dollar cookies, penny candy, icy cups. Um, and I remember being outside with my friends and I didn't have money. And my friends was like, come on, go ask your grandma for a couple of dollars. Let's go to the candy store. And I was like, my grandma is not about to give me no money. And this grown old man, like he was old, right? Um, I remember because he had like gray hair and he was kind of funny looking, you know? And he was like, oh, don't worry, you know, come over here, uh, uncle, uncle, whatever. I can't remember his name. He's like, uncle such and such has you. And he gave me 
$20. And I remember being so freaking excited, like, oh my God, I'm about to buy up the store. That dude looked out, not understanding that what he was really doing is trying to um, rail me in, right? So the next time I saw him, he then started having inappropriate conversations with me, right? And then was like, oh, come upstairs with me for a second. And then I became terrified and I just avoided him at all costs. Um, and then as I like just grew, I just knew like through the abuse from my, from my parents, from my, um, my aunties, everyone abused my body. My grandmother abused me, men abused me, my cousins abused my body. Um, and I just remember one time my grandmother put me in a closet because I broke um, a cup, um, like a mug cup or something. And I was super young, you know, you break shit. And um, I sat in that closet all day, y'all, like 12 hours. And I remember sobbing and sobbing and just being so like broken. And I remember, and this is when I became a spiritual being, like for real, like I've always been a spiritual being, but this is when I realized that something else was out there that was bigger than me. I'm in the closet crying, sobbing, and I just, I don't, I can't explain it. I felt this presence of calmness that, that like reminded me, it's okay. Uh, you're going to be okay. And I, I stopped crying and it was like this overwhelming sense of peace. And I just fell asleep in the closet. And then when I woke up like hours later from that moment, I knew that in order to protect myself, I had to like talk to God. And I wasn't even sure who or what God was. But that day forward, anytime something happened to me, I called on God, right? And another example, and I'm gonna wrap this up, y'all, but another um, situation occurred with my, my mother's boyfriend. I was sitting on, I was laying on the couch. I had just woke up. I had to be like 12. Um, and my mom was gone. I don't know where she was. He gets in the shower. He comes out the shower <clears throat> and he comes and stands in front of me, y'all in his towel and he opens his towel he drops his towel and i clo i close my eyes and i said my god you said that I, all i had to do is ask for you don't let this man do this to me and i opened my eyes he picked up his towel and he walked away and that was when i knew that i could always call on that strength and as i got older and 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 just unpacked what spirituality is and what trauma is I've, I've been able to take that that pain and environmental crap and relate to my people and that's why i'm so passionate about it because and i'm so passionate about not playing respectability politics i'm so passionate about not putting people into constructs i'm so passionate about us understanding our trauma and healing because our trauma like really does create who we are, like our identity, our fire, all that, I, all that you see has been created in the fiery furnace, right? Like I've been burnt alive and rebirth. And I don't play when, when it comes to black people because what we've been through is undescribable, is indescribable. You can't ar articulate what all the generations and multi-generations of trauma has brought my family up into that point where everybody I came into contact with thought it was okay to abuse my body, right? And it's not like I'm like, it, it, at the juncture I am right now, I'm not mad, right? Because I understand the environmental, right? I understand now that how slavery paid a part of that because in my household, my great grandma was still alive and she works on the cotton field, right? And she was a hard woman. I mean, hard, hard, hard. But now understanding that that hardness was a direct result of what she experienced. And even though I get tired, and even though I don't want to march, and even though I said I don't want to protest, I think about what my ancestors had to endure, that their bodies were found with their bones, had detached from the muscles because they worked so hard. So if we say that we tired, we don't know shit about tired. So I push on and I carry it all because I feel like if they did, I have to, and I am I am pushing and screaming and hollering the, the voice and the energy of my ancestors. And that's what I will continue to do. Ooh. I think we need to take a collective breath. I don't think we can hear the stories of Emma or Brandy and hear that trauma and that experience. And I see it in the chat box resonating with so many of us. These stories are individual. These stories are our community stories. These stories are historical trauma stories. And so I'm just trying to invite us all right now to not just let those words happen and keep moving. 
Um, and Lisa already modeled it for us. She took a breath right away. So I'm just wondering if we can just together, just breathe in and exhale slowly. Maybe one more, because I still feel it in my chest. Breathe in and exhale slowly. Thank you, sorry. Thank you for sharing. Um, uh, tell us what, what we're hearing in the comments in the chat earlier, some powerful comments. Burnt alive and, and rise up. Um, Brandy, you are a phoenix um, rising, um, a pearl indeed. There are earlier comments. M, um, there's so many I can't scroll back. Uh, but as Aaliyah says, um, some folks said, M, wow, our lives are so similar. Um, so much trauma, so real. Uh, but the beauty in it is, uh, as, you, as you said in different words, Brandy, the impossibility of what we've been through and what we've overcome, but we are overcoming. We still rise. We are overcoming. And the work that has emerged is so informed um, by all those experiences, how you both have turned it around to create this healing movement for our young people. Um, and it gives layers of understanding on, on what we see with our young people who surround you um, and your advocacy and the, the endlessness and the depth of your advocacy for our young people who we know are carrying uh, so much. I think we all needed to hear, we all needed to hear uh, the layers of what you shared um, and to bring it back around. Um, and it's hard to move ahead of that because we kind of want to sit in it with both of you. We kind of want to sit in it and just wrap you in the collective warmth of acknowledging uh, what you just shared with us because there's so much there and so many of us relate on different points to different experiences that you brought up and that's a whole another conversation. So Lisa, Lisa, we move on, can I say one thing? Yes. Okay, I just want to um, add to that conversation that that, that is also why I'm, a, I'm adamant that we as Black people and supporters of Black people do not throw our children under the bus as it relates to the, um, their movement and their protests. Um, when we had our protest the other day, I came in contact with two Black boys that I didn't know um, that held me so tight and cried so hard and said, I'm tired of dying. I'm tired of the police chasing me. Um, and when the mayor showed up at our protest, um, one young man was like, why are you here? You, all, you guys always show up to make promises and you do nothing. We're still dying. They're still treating us like nothing. I don't want to be treated like nothing. I don't want to be an embarrassment. I'm tired of being an embarrassment. And so with that, with, with my experience of being a kid and being outraged and being unprotected, I can late, relate to our children, right? Because at the end of the day, racism, our environment, capitalism, all of that has left our children hanging. Mass incarceration, the war on drugs, crack cocaine era, it, des it destroyed everything that we had following the civil rights movement. And that's all institutional and all systematic, without any control, without any say-so, without, without anything. And then our kids are out there raging. And what they're really asking us to do is, is stand with them hold them, a, a hold space for them to vent, to express themselves, because where do they go? They have parents who are working from dawn to night, right? Not, not by choice, but by force, because that is the environment and the, the, the culture and society we live in. So I just ask that all everyone that's on this live practice not being part of a narrative where we criminalize our children, dehumanize our children, and commodify our children, and leave them out to the wolves, and the wolves being the National Guard, the wolves being the police. Let's not do this. Let's participate in policing our children. Let's, I encourage everyone, because we're not doing an outside um, action today. We're doing political education at four, so I'm encouraging everyone who has the capability and ability to show up tonight for our children, show up with supplies, show up with love, show up with the standing right next to them, chanting with them, feeling their energy, and what you will find that most of them will turn around and have a conversation with you, and you will hear and feel things you, you haven't been exposed to, because the space that they've been creating for themselves is what they've been yearning for this whole time. 
Sorry about that. Yes, Brandy, to all of that. Yes, and Brandy has invited everyone to come out tonight. Um, if you can, we can, April, maybe you have information on uh, where uh, that political education is tonight. So folks who are able to come out will and connect to the work on other nights that they are more available. We have one minute, but we're going to go over. So M and Brandy, you tell us if you can go over by a few minutes because we got a little bit more we need to cover. And for those who can stay with us, please stay with us. Um, we have so many questions and folks have already said, yes, we need a part two with you both. Um, but just to say, um, uh, I pray for healing, protection, love for you all. Uh, thank you both. I needed this. Thank you for reopening my eyes. Powerful way to start our day. Thank you, Em and Brandy, for your inspiration. Um, never throw our children under the bus, sending everyone a virtual hug. Um, Em. How do we bring it back around? So, you know, we all know that as we're doing this work in various ways, we're ultimately working for black liberation. Um, and right now it's not clear, you know, it's not clear day to day what the next day is gonna bring, what the next action needs to be. And we got policymakers and leaders calling to say, what should we do? Nobody knows what to do, right? The leaders uh, are doing their best perhaps, but they don't know what to do. I think we know what to do and at minimum, we know what we envision for ourselves. What does, what does Black liberation look and feel like and sound like once we've gotten to the other side? Talk us through that. Yeah. So one of the things that I think is so critical for Black liberation is the end of patriarchy. And so patriarchy, as I'm defining it, is about a system, about a culture, about an ideology, that's about the domination and control of women, LGBTQ people, children, and the environment, right? And so often when we think about um, ending or moving toward Black liberation, we think a lot about what white folks are doing to, the, to us with not a closer examination about what happens between us and then also how their patriarchy um, is hitting our bodies. And so what that means to me um, is this. So as I mentioned, I'm a Baba of adopted children. And one of the things that I teach my children is that your body is yours. This body is your body. Nobody can touch this body, be on this body, name your body for you, you name your body for yourself, put things in your body, make you eat this, make you do this, make you, nobody has the right to do that. And so I do a lot of work with my children as well as in, inside of Freedom Inc. and the movement and really getting, in particular, children, women and girls, LGBTQ young people to understand that, that this is your body for all of the reasons that Brandy went into about her story. And so in my work, um, Sandra Bland's story really hurt me really badly because the thing that I loved about Sandra Bland, the thing that I actually want for my children is an assertion. Get off of me. Get out of my face. You cannot do this to me. I have dignity. I have value. I have worth and I will not bow down to you. This is what I teach my children. Inside with white supremacy, intermeshed with white supremacy is patriarchy. He killed Sandra Bland, they killed Sandra Bland, not just because she was black, but because she was also resisting patriarchy. Because she also said, I am against your control. I am against your dominion. This is my body, you cannot touch me. And the thing, the reason why I'm saying that that is such an essential feature of black liberation is because that is the moving into dignity. So when I think of what's on the other side of us for Black liberation, it's that. It's the right to, it's, it's my bodily autonomy that's on the other side in that liberation. It's my ability to say, I don't want to be touched. It's my ability to say, I want to be in relationship with you or I do not want to be in relationship with you. It is my choice. I want to have kids or I do not want to have kids. It is my choice. I want to clean up today or I do not want to clean up today that it is my 
choice, right? And so self-determination to me is about that, right? As black folks, we have to end all of white supremacy. And as part of that, we have to undo the patriarchy that has shaped this brand of white supremacy onto our bodies. So for me, so much of black liberation is ending that, right? It's no more are we gonna be burying black women killed by partners. No more are we gonna be having just to kind of accept that sexual assault is gonna happen to black women girls. No more this sort of terrorism that's just there. The fear that people have. I mean, people fearing they can't just walk on the street at night because of police and because of a uh, possible violent man, right? So that to me is what's on the other side of black liberation. And I am lifting that up because oftentimes that's not talked about inside of black liberation. But I know that that is the center of it because i know that that was so much of what enslaved us is that we even lost control of our wounds wounds yes. we lost control over saying that this is my child and you will not do that to my child this is my body and you will not do that to me and having the ability to to enslave us continuously through our reproductive abilities so to me that is the other side of black liberation. It is the abolishment of all forms of patriarchal violence by anybody. I love y'all. I just have to say, I am feeling so, we are gaining so much. Um, we are gaining so much. Um, oh my God, uncover the truth. Say that um, you are speaking the truth, my sister self-determination uh we are on fire uh in this chat you don't know what you're doing this morning um with what we needed to hear right now in this moment brandy what's your take on black liberation what does it look like on the other side um i, I i'm gonna echo um a little bit of what M said and um agree you know totally what everything she said um in order for us to be free we must be able to self-actualize as we see fit um, and that's why um, we, the foundation of all of our work is political education, including understanding the context of our existence, which y'all always hear me say, which is white supremacy, patriarchal capitalism. We must understand how everything that we say, everything that we do, every, every way that we interact it is grounded and founded in that white supremacy, patriarchal capitalism, racism sprung out of patriarchy, right? It wasn't pa racism and then patriarchy. Patriarchy was first this idea that women are less than this idea that men need to dominate this idea that um, we're not capable of handling ourselves or that we're, we're over emotional. It, it, and the crazy part about all that in Black liberation is that we have to bring, somehow bring our men along with us, right? Because it's this disconnect between white supremacy model of patriarchy, right? Like our men are modeling this and, and not just men, but people who identify as that, you know, that gender or, in, in, you know, uh, replicate the attributes of it, right? Because it's not a gender, really. It's it's just a way of being. And a lot of us embody it. Women embody it. Like traditional women embody it. When when women, when the young women or the next generation is coming up, and we're like, I'm I'm a free sexual being. Oh, you a hoe. You this and you that. Well, actually, she's do it, it, what she's doing is radical. It is anti patriarchy, right? It's anti social constructs. And I'm down for anything that's anti white supremacy, patriarchal capitalism, whatever the anti is whatever the opposite of what that stands for I'm all for because liberation looks like our men and our and our entire the entire black nation understanding that in our liberation will not come by Im, Im, uh, replicating or imitating the white man's model of malehood it just will not because you cannot come into my home and probably is why I'm single so let's get clarification I ain't got no partner right like so that's probably why because I ain't going right <laughs> I ain't going so anyway that's a whole nother conversation so part of this is like this this want black women to fit into this construct 
of, of woman is, uh, uh, this idea of woman is that we were never allowed to be. I'm not allowed to be in a place where someone's providing and doing and protecting me. That has never been our reality, right? We've been working the fields next to you. We've been next to you. We've been pushing for you. We've been on the front line. We need another model of being, right? We need another understanding outside the context of white supremacy, patriarchal capitalism, which is why all of our work is based on that. Because if we don't understand white supremacy, patriarchal capitalism, then everything we think and breathe and think is true will only confuse us in the words of Nellie Fuller, right? Like, so in order for us to create a different paradigm, a different trajectory for black people in true black liberation, we got to learn this chessboard so that we can learn to operate outside of it. And that is where our black liberation is. We got to make space for all black people, all black thoughts. I mean, the ratchet, the non-ratchet, the professional, the scholars, all alike, because if we are not monolithic people. And as someone who prides themselves in being you know, intellectual and reading and expanding my mind and my understanding of God and spirituality and the universe and healing and trauma and all of that, I can still take it to the streets, right? And we should all be like multifaceted. Like, don't try to put me in a box and tell me I got to act a certain way. And that to me is liberation. And as M stated, we have to like demand control over ourselves and, and, and not fold because that is where our dignity comes from. And that is where our freedom comes from. Oh. It is 10, 10, and I want this conversation to go on for another hour. Um, so we're going to commit right now to having you all come back. We're going to reach back to the both of you, Em and Brandy, um, in the midst of everything that you're doing right now. I know how busy you are, um, in addition to the movements that you're leading and the organizations that you're leading, which is a whole another level. And of course, as we said earlier, your families, but we're going to ask you right now in front of everybody, will you come back a second time in the very near future to continue? Because everyone on the chat wants to hear more, needs to hear more. And we have a whole conversation to have about this new paradigm. We've been saying that now for about five years, specifically around what does the new paradigm look like? How do we build that? How do we shape that? We're all developing it, right? I believe that all of our work is part of a new paradigm. Yeah. Um, but we need something more concrete right now as we look at a world that has changed. Um, someone who may be on this call said to me in a message the other night, the world has changed even so than it was four days ago. One week ago, the world is different. We're not in the same world that we were in last month, last year, and that um, we have to be aware and conscious that we're constructing something new and it's going to come out of conflict and it's not going to get easier before it gets harder. Um, and we have to understand this so we have the staying power and the mental and physical and spiritual capacity to push our way through what's not going to be fixed tomorrow. Um, how do we do this? How do we, and this, this could be the final question, um, what do you say, and someone says ongoing series, <laughs> part two, three, four, and five, because we could talk about the whole relationship thing too, Brandy. We got, that's a whole other thing. But what do we say to Black women on this call and who are listening in on Facebook Live, um, as you all have talked so eloquently about your evolution through the personal, which is political, and then it shapes and informs the work um, and then it gives a language and then we are led to this place of a new paradigm. How do we as black women claim that space and that power, particularly for those who are not sure how to exercise their power, you know, who are just coming into the awareness that they have power or who were doubting that they have power? From your experience, how did you step into the power? How do we step into the power and find our place in building this new paradigm for our community? Yeah. <laughs> Come on, y'all. Y'all muted. I can't hear anybody. You're muted. <laughs> I was saying, go ahead, Brandy. Oh, go ahead, Brandy. <laughs> <laughs> Brandy. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, is Lolita talking? Okay, she went back mute. Okay. Yeah, I was trying to talk. Who was trying to talk? Lolita. Okay. Okay, Lolita, you have a comment? Yeah, I think you just asked a question like how we got in this space. 
Um, we, yeah, we asked how do we uh, help women to understand how to step into their power to help build this new paradigm that we're in. Right, and, and so what, what makes me like really think hard about it is I just like got into my own personal space, moved into my own apartment a month ago, right? And it was because of urban triage. I went through the, through the cohort and I'll never forget after the cohort and walked up to Brandy and she said, you know, you got to get out that situation, don't you, baby? And I just, it was yeah. just stuck with me and it never left. And I was like, but I don't know how. And, and I never forgot what she said. And so I used that, the power that she gave to me to get out of that situation. And my, my job now is to empower other women. And I need you to like help me build that platform so that I can continue on the process of helping other people. Brandy, thank you so much. Oh my God, I'm so freaking proud of you! If y'all know this woman's story, I am so freaking proud of you. Ooh, amen, hallelujah, yes. So yeah. Yeah, hell yeah. Okay, so part of um, stepping into our power is healing, right? Because the power is already there. Y'all, like, Black people, look, Black people, God didn't make no mistakes. Like, we, we have built civilizations. Ain't nothing out that exists in this world that we ain't touched and created, right? Nothing, nothing. And we exist in the context where we've been conditioned to believe everything white is right. Well, guess what? Everything white has been patented and taken from you. So the power really exists in understanding where we come from, what we've done, what we created, and looking at our world and looking at our baggage, looking at the things that keep us from making decisions that, um, that align with our healing and our like what, what we need for ourselves. Because part of the training of urban triage um, the things, one of the things that we teach is what is your racket? What consistently persists in your life that you say you don't want, right? And how do you, you, you identify it? And how do you move past it? And not move past it, like forget it. Like I haven't moved past the, the 20 years that I've been abused and neglected and unprotected, but how do you look at it and, and, and appreciate the experience for what it was? Like my experience as traumatic and hurtful and, and like dehumanizing as it, 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 it was, it also shaped me into a, a, a beast, right? Like, I feel like I'm a beast. Like, you, you don't get to do things to me. And it, it's made me fearless. So if I would choose to stay in that place of being a victim, of having some, being, staying in the, in the past where I'm thinking and dwelling on all the hurt and pain, then I stay in that moment of being weak. But I'm not weak. That, that has allowed me to be the strong, and not strong in the sense that I don't hurt because I do hurt and I'm learning to be vulnerable and I'm learning to cry and I'm learning to feel and I'm learning to let it go. But if we're not identifying the things in our world and our life and in our behaviors that keep us from having the world and creating the possibilities we want for ourselves, um, then we, we remain stuck within the context of white supremacy. When we can look at white supremacy for what it was and detach for identifying what the constructs is put on us, then we become powerful automatically because we no longer have to internalize that black inferiority that goes hand in hand with white superior, I mean, supremacy. We can look at ourselves in the mirror and be like, damn, everything that around me, my, my, my ancestors created from the alphabets to the light, to the peanut butter, to the to heart surgery, to the cell phone, to, to the lawnmower, right? It ain't nothing that we haven't put our hands on. And when we when we understand that, then we then can stand on the shoulders of our ancestors, right? And that's some powerful stuff. So in order to step into our power, we must look to our past and be like, God damn, we did that. We built them pyramids. There were no damn aliens, right? That was the power of us. That is where we are descendants from. And to know that that is powerful within itself. Oh, M, what is your last word on that? What is your last word on that before we close? This is so powerful. And, and we're not, you know, Aaliyah, I would tell you, read the comments, but 
uh, all I can say is there seems to be firm agreement that we need more of this. And I know there are more transformation stories. And um, the key was mentioned, women who are empowered then turn around to empower more women. And we need to be consciously aware as black women is that is the charge of our generation. We must wake up in the morning knowing that that is our job. Our job is to be empowered so we can turn around and empower. And because we have access to our whole community and family system as mothers, as lovers, as partners, as spouses, we impact everyone when we own our power. Our communities transform when we own our power. So you have to step into it, it's already there. M, what's your last and final word? So I'm actually going to call on an ancestor, June Jordan, whose work I follow, who has fed me spiritually and continues to do so, to say, um, how is it that I move into my power? And she says, I am a feminist. And what that means to me, as much as the same as the meaning of the fact that I am Black, it means that I must undertake to love myself and to respect myself as though my very life depends upon self-love and self-respect. And then she goes to say, I am not wrong. Wrong is not my name. My name is my own, my own, my own. And I can't tell you who the hell set things up like this, but I can tell you that from now on, my resistance, my simple and daily and nightly self-determination may very well cost you your life. And so how I move into my power is from that place. I am not wrong. That shame, that blame is not mine. I will not hold the responsibility for any wrongdoing done to me. I think that is the first step. We must reject. We must throw that off of us. That sexual assault is not mine. That domestic violence is not mine. That white Boss is not mine. This fool at the welfare office, that is not mine. And I think as soon as we begin to push off that shame, we give space for light. We give space for light. I am not wrong. Wrong is not my name. Shout out to Lolita. That relationship is not mine. That fool in that house, that is not mine. That is not me. I will push this blame and shame on the head of where it belongs. And it is not on me. And I think when we take that seriously, when we take seriously putting the blame and the shame on the fool and not the victim, we will move inevitably into the fullness of our power. And so I have spent my life pushing those things back. I ain't all into the church, but the grandma said, get thee behind me. You hear me? Get thee behind me. So we're not going, you know, part two, we can get it in part two. Woo! What I'm trying to say is we have to push off those things. They are not ours. And that is the first step. Do not hold that trauma. Do not claim that trauma. That is not yours. Push it back on them. Make them deal with it. We will sleep at night, we will be healthy, we will drink water, we will eat food, we will rest, we will be good and kind to our children. We will not allow violence on our bodies, on our children, and in our homes. Push that mess back. So that's how we move into our power. Now, I want to quickly say before you can end this up, make sure people check out the Facebook page to check what we got going on. And then also, we're talking about building an altar that's in defending black womanhood. Yes. Because we show up for everybody and people don't be showing up for us. And so we want to give some space in the midst of this fight to lift up the amount of violence against black women, police violence, murders of transgender black women, et cetera. So if you're interested in that, check out the Facebook page. Brandy looking at me like, why ain't that? We ain't got the date planned yet. Well, I'm okay, just I'm gonna right. because we in the vibe of it. So I'm just telling people, look at the page for when that happens. So we, we're going to create space where we can be building this power and community in person together. Through an Amen. Amen. You all, that is our time. That is our time today. We are grateful to you, M and Brandy. We are elevated because of you today. We feel like um, we've left something on this call. We've left some traumas behind. We're leaving behind all those things you named M. We're not stepping off this call the way we came. I can feel the energy that we are more empowered and hopeful since we've been on this one hour call. I see tears being wiped from eyes. I feel transformations in the works. I feel a new paradigm evolving as we speak 
and I see black women healing as we fight. And I want to thank each and every one of you for being here today. Brandy and Em, we're going to get on your calendar immediately. So expect to hear from us right away. You see the crowd came out for you all today. This is what we needed. This is what we want. Do not ever doubt that we are with you. We are with you when you see us. We are with you when you don't see us. We are a phone call away. We love you. We embrace you. And we send love to every person on this call, including our brother Harper. I see a man on this call. <laughs> we cheering up our brothers this morning. Um, <laughs> and with that, I will close. Uh, thanking our team, the foundation team, which helps us to host these sessions. They are so committed. Um, we all needed this today as our energies were a little bit funny this morning, mine particularly, and now I'm on fire again. Uh, we ask you to go with this quote from our ancient ancestors, know thyself, love thyself, heal thyself. Our healing starts and ends with us, and we have the power. We love you, and we'll see you back here next week. Thank you. Ashe. Thank you.